right, ladies and gentlemen, week two, or week three, I'm sorry, but message two, one thing I love about what we do, if you don't get done with week two, with the, with the message, you go ahead and just take it right into the second one. So we might have to do that again. Hutch, right. give it up for Hutch, everybody. Thanks, Ryan. All right, guys, we need to hustle. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day, Moses, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian and sat down by a will. We started this teaching last week, and as the one-sentence theme of our talk, we had this. It's printed there in your bifold. Our failures cannot thwart God's faithfulness. You know what? We need to personalize that. And so I want you to say this with me this morning. We're going to say together, my failures cannot thwart God's faithfulness. Would you say that with me? My failures cannot thwart God's faithfulness. Let's say that again. My failures cannot thwart God's faithfulness. Do you understand that? Because I am looking at a bunch of failures this morning. I don't mean to tear you down. It's no Tony Robbins build you up. You are the greatest and most amazing thing that has ever walked the face of the earth because that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says we're all messed up and we have all messed up. And not only are we all messed up and have we all messed up, but we've also all failed. If you failed one time, you were a failure. But the truth of the matter is, as I stand before you today as a man who has failed far more times than I can count. And truth be known, everyone under the sound of my voice, whether it's on YouTube or here in this room this morning, has failed more than once, right? But your failure cannot, does not, and will not thwart God's faithfulness. As we began our study together last week, the first point is filled in there in your bifold was this. And aren't you glad for this? God specializes in using imperfect people. So we've already established the fact that we're messed up. We've already established the fact that we have all failed. So guess what? You are a spectacular candidate for God to use how did Moses fail? Well, we saw quickly last week, and we'll just run through this as fast as we possibly can. First of all, we saw last week that he messed up because he acted impulsively. Have you ever acted impulsively? Sure. He also failed because he attempted to do God's work in his own way. God, you're not moving fast enough. You need a little help. You need a little jump start. So we do a little bit on our part to get God moving because we don't think he's moving fast enough. Thirdly, Moses failed because he was anxious about what other people thought about him. Have you ever thought more about what other people think of you than what God thinks of you? I don't want to do this. I don't want to share my faith. I don't want to start that ministry. I don't do what you're calling me to do because I might fail. I might flounder. I may not be perfect in it. And I'm more concerned about what people think on the horizontal plane than what God thinks on the vertical plane. We need to get to the point of maturity in our life where the most important thing is, is that, that vertical. God, are you pleased no matter what anybody else thinks? And then fourthly, Moses failed because he took action in his own timetable. Number five, Moses failed because he tried to annihilate the evidence of his sin. He tried to cover it up. He buried the man in the sand that he had killed. And the only problem is even if not a single soul on the face of the earth were to see the sin we try to hide, it is open before God and he sees it all. As a matter of fact, not only does he see my sin, he sees and knows me so well that he even knows the motivation 
inside of me that caused me to do what I did, even when I don't realize it and recognize it. So it's a foolish thing to try to cover our sin. It's really because we think more about what other people are gonna think about our sin than what God thinks about it. And then finally, Moses failed because he assumed others would understand his actions. And the scriptures here, of course, we went to the book of Acts chapter 7, and they didn't. So God specializes in using imperfect people. But today we want to begin, and we're going to go real fast, so pin your ears back. You ready? Here we go. Number two, write this down in your notes. And I say write it down because I know you're getting older and you cannot remember as well as you used to remember. And, and the reason why I ask you to write it down is not because I want you to remember what Hutch said, but because I want you to remember what God is saying to you in this moment. As I stand before you to teach, as Ron stands before you to teach, I can guarantee you that it is our prayer that we might simply be a vessel through which the spirit of the living God could flow. And my prayer, and I know Ron's prayer is, is God, I I used to pray this prayer, say, God, use me. And I heard an old preacher say, we need to stop praying a prayer that says, God, use me. And we need to start praying, God, make me usable. And I don't know about you, but that's worth the cost of admission this morning. If you don't get anything else out of this day, Get this this morning. It's not God bless me. It's not God use me. It's God make me usable. And that's really what this second point is all about. Write this down. Number two, God shapes imperfect people before he uses them. God shapes imperfect people before he uses them. Verse 15 says this, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. So here's Moses. He's the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he realizes that he has committed a capital offense and Pharaoh is out to kill him, he runs, he hides about as far away as you could possibly go. He goes to the backside of a barren desert. That seems interesting that you would use the words barren and desert in the same sentence, but that's what kind of uh, the desert it was. It was a barren desert. There wasn't much anything there at all, but apparently there was a well there because he found a well and he stopped there to get a drink of water. Have you ever been working in the yard, working at work, somewhere where you were so thirsty, you would give your life savings for a bottle of water? So here's Moses. Imagine He has left all of the trappings of Pharaoh's house where servants would wait on him hand and foot, where all he had to do was just uh, clear his throat and somebody would jump to attention to meet his need, to make his request fulfilled. And now he's on the backside of the desert. He sits down by a well to get a drink of water. Some ladies come up. He didn't realize it at the time, but one of them was going to be his future bride. What's interesting, we can't go there. We don't have time. The Bible never says that Zephora ever loved Moses or Moses ever loved Zephora, but but that was the gift that was given to him. That's a study for another day. Uh, And I don't know why I said that. Somebody needed that today. But but he's surrounded in in Egypt by well-educated movers and shakers in the most powerful nation on the face of the planet. And now he's on the backside of the desert with some female shepherds, some other shepherds, but he's really all alone. And that caused me to think about what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64 and verse eight. You see it there in your notes. It says, but now, O Lord, Isaiah said, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of of your hand. What does it mean to be clay in the potter's hands? Three thoughts. Number one, God has shaped us to be useful. God has shaped us to be useful. 
2 Timothy 2 and verse 21, uh, the apostle Paul writing to his protege in the faith, young Timothy, who is now a pastor, he says this, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. To say that we are clay in the hands of the potter acknowledges God's handiwork as the master potter in our life. And the potter has the right to make of the clay whatever he chooses. A lot of times we look around and we say, oh, if I could only be a little taller, or maybe I wish I wasn't so tall. If I could be a little skinnier, or if I could only gain some weight, or I wish I was left-handed, or I wish I was right-handed. We're so dissatisfied in ourselves and the way God made us, aren't we? There's billions of dollars spent every year telling you how you can be something that, that you're not. But the truth is God made you the way you are because he wants to use you as you are. Why? Because he has shaped you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We work with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and they teach us something nearly every day. No, they don't have academic awards. They may have a high school diploma that says, you finished. But yet God uses my 31-year-old son with Down syndrome to teach me this week. By the way, did you know God is always speaking? You do know that, right? Because he is always at work around you. And here I am at the end of our day, and I am taking Kevin, a 51-year-old guy in our group with Down syndrome, and my son's 31 years old, so there's 20 years difference between the two of them. And we're getting them into the car. I'm getting, getting Kevin, I'm uh, getting my son into to our car to go home with my wife. I'm taking Kevin home, so he's getting in my truck. But both of them are following me, and they're not listening. My son has headphones on, and Kevin can't hear. He's got hearing aids on, but I don't think they're turned on. And I am just in this moment, I am thinking to myself, as, as I said, Kevin, come here. Josh, go get in mom's car. And when I pointed this way, both of them turned around and went back to her car. And then I yelled a little bit louder, uh, Kevin, come this way. Both of them turned around and followed me this way. And God spoke to me in that moment. That's us. He's speaking, but we've got headphones on. He's speaking and we've got hearing aids, but we don't want to hear. God tells me to do this, but I don't want to do it. God has shaped you so that he can use you for his glory. Number two, quickly write this down. God shapes us into Christ's image. God shapes us into Christ's image. Romans 8, verses 28 and 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew. Get this. He also predestined, predetermined to be conformed to the image, the likeness of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Our heavenly father wants to use the circumstances and the situations of life to mold us and to shape us into what he has for us. So he has shaped us. He's given us spiritual gifts and passions and abilities and personalities and experiences. He had shaped us, but he also is shaping us into Christ-like character. When you looked at the more, in the mirror this morning, and I trust most of you did, looking around, it looks like most of you did. Did you see a little more Jesus in you this morning than you did yesterday? That's the goal. The goal is that I be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. The goal is I love Jesus a little more today than I did yesterday. And the goal is tomorrow I will look a little bit more like Jesus 
that I do today. Because he is shaping me and he's shaping you. And then number three, and this may be as important as all the rest that we talked about this morning. And that is this, God reshapes us in our brokenness. God reshapes us in our brokenness. I don't know if you've ever done pottery. I've not sat at a potter's wheel. I did pottery when the thing came out of an oven and you painted it and then it went back in the oven and it came out pretty, right? Do that in art class in middle school or high school somewhere. Never really sat down where you're pumping the thing and spinning it. But, but I could imagine with my hands, if I was working the potter's wheel and I'm working on this piece and I'm trying to shape it, it's not going the way it's in my head, my head and my fingers, there's a disconnection and I'm working at it and it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be shaping up. And I know that if I was a potter on more than one occasion, I would just take it and push it all back together and start over again. Jeremiah 18 says this, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the Lord from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. Did you get that? Don't skip over that. I will let you hear my words. Turn your hearing aid on. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. It was messed up. It was deformed. It was malformed. It was, it wasn't going to work. And, and he, the potter reworked it into a, another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. I wanted to start this lesson by talking about bowls. In Bible times, especially in Old Testament times, you know they really only had one container. And it was a clay pot, a clay jar. Everything went into the clay pot or the clay jar. Water went in there. Wine went in there. Jelly beans went in there. Everything went in there. If you were to go to my kitchen today, you could open up cabinet after cabinet. Guess what you'll see? You'll see plastic bowls and ceramic bowls and square things, Tupperware and rectangular and lasagna pans. And you see all kinds of things. Each one of them has a distinct use and a purpose. And when you and I, of our own volition, fail God says you know what I'm just going to start again and sometimes if you have ever experienced brokenness in your life you'll know this to be true if there was a piece of pottery here and it had already gone through the fire and it just wasn't right the potter would smash it obliterate it. It'd be in a thousand little pieces. There would be dust everywhere. But we have a heavenly father who will take the dust and take the pieces and push it and mold it and shape it and glue it and fix it and repair it and make it into something not only useful, but beautiful. It may not be beautiful to our eyes, but as the master potter, he looks at it and says, it's exactly what I was looking for. And then point number three, write this down. God sets imperfect people in position to lead others. God sets imperfect people into position to lead others. Now we're gonna to go to the tables. We're gonna have some great discussion. I'm gonna come back and give you two examples and we'll wrap this up in just a few minutes. God bless us, we go to the tables. Thank you.
All right, what have we discovered already in this message? Number one, we discovered that God specializes in using imperfect people. And that means that each and every one of us is a perfect candidate to be used by God. Secondly, we learned that God shapes his imperfect people before he uses them. And then finally, we said that God sets imperfect people in position to lead others. I want to elaborate on that for just a couple of minutes. And the way I want to elaborate on it is just give you two biblical examples. The first biblical example that I want you to see with me today is a guy by the name of Peter. Peter in Luke chapter 22 was a guy who uh, was one of the three, he was close to Jesus. He was one of the 12, but he was one of that inner circle of Jesus. And Jesus said to him one day, he said to get behind me, Satan. That's a pretty powerful word coming from the son of God. But then later on, Jesus said to Peter, just literally hours before Jesus's crucifixion, Jesus looks at Peter and says, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny that you ever even knew me three times. And Peter, with an impassion that only a guy like Peter could do, says, Lord, I will follow you to prison and to death, but I will never deny you. And then hours later, we see that he is seen in the crowd. He's walking at a distance. Somebody recognizes him. Hey, weren't you one of Jesus's followers? No way. Uh Uh-uh. And then it says that, that he came and he was seated with the crowd. And somebody looked at him and said, hey, hey you, you look, w- weren't you one of his closest followers? No, you've got me mistaken for somebody else. And just a little bit later on, on this cool evening in which Jesus has been betrayed, mocked, beaten, bloodied, beard plucked out, falsely accused. Peter's standing around a fire getting warm. A young lady looks at him and says, hey, listen, (laughs) I know you were with him. And Peter lets out a few choice expletives and says, no, not me. And scripture says in Luke 22 that immediately the rooster crowed. And immediately as the rooster crowed, Peter's eyes and Jesus's eyes met. And you remember when we were talking about brokenness back here? Peter, it says, went out and wept bitterly. That's code for he was broken to pieces. Jesus continues to go through that process where he dies on the cross. Three days later, he is miraculously risen from the grave. And then on Pentecost, Penta 55, uh, uh, seven weeks later on, on day 50 after his resurrection, Peter stands in Acts chapter two and he preaches a message a message that God supernaturally induces. And scripture tells us that 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. God sets imperfect people to lead others. Oh, let me tell you about another guy. I just thought of this one. Think about this and write this one down. His name is Paul. (laughs) You remember Paul? You remember Paul in the scriptures where it says in Acts chapter nine, as he's telling his story, I was minding my own business, persecuting the church. I had letters. I went down to Damascus to arrest people for being a part of the church. Can you imagine The local authorities come through those doors. They see you, they see me, they see us, they see our Bibles, they hear our message and they take us to jail. 
Why? For being Christians. That's not so hard to imagine, is it? But that's what Paul was doing. Then all of a sudden on his road to Damascus, a bright light shines. A voice speaks. He's knocked to the ground. He can't see, but he hears the voice of God. Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And there, a guy by the name of Saul is transformed into the guy that we know as the Apostle Paul. And now he goes from being someone who was pursuing the church to destroy it, to building the church, to planting the church, to sharing the good news of the gospel to writing a third to a half of our New Testament under the inspiration of the spirit of the living God. Undoubtedly the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of the planet. Why? Because God shapes us, is shaping us, and will reshape us. Because he wants to use us. Because we are made in his image and in his likeness. We are, as Ephesians 2.10 says, his work of art. You are a work of art. God is molding you and shaping you and making you into the person he wants you to be so that he can work through you because there are people on the face of this planet that only you can minister to. I can't do it. Somebody else in this room can't do it. Somebody else under the sound of my voice can't do it. But he is molding you and shaping you and making you into the person he wants you to be so that he can use you. And he will use you if you just let him. Father in heaven, every single one of us is a cracked pot. But you are the master potter. And you specialize in taking cracked pots like us and remaking us for your glory. Have your own way in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, guys. Next week, Ron is back with uh, 59. Number, what, 57 you're on? I don't know. It's going to take about three years to get through that. And then on Halloween weekend, I know that's one of your favorite weekends of the year. I expect you all to be dressed up that day. I'm going to come back and I'm going to seek an attempt to answer a question that as a pastor, I am asked as much as pretty much anything. And that is, this is how do I hear from God? And I'm not coming in as an expert. I'm coming in as a fellow learner who after 40 plus years of walking with God is still learning how to hear from God. Like one day this week when I looked behind me and I saw two guys with Down syndrome and God's teaching me. If you're open, God will continue to teach you to hear from him and to know it's his voice, not somebody else's or even your own. We're gonna find that out from the life of Moses. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with that next week. Papa Ron is back. We'll see you then. God bless. Hope to see you there.